accused of funding armed groups to secure its business in Syria. French firm Lafarge could face renewed charges of complicity in crimes against humanity. So what role do foreign companies play in fueling conflicts and could they be held accountable? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Mahalbarra. Lafarge is facing one of the most serious accusations laid against a French company over its actions in Syria. The Paris Court of Appeal had dismissed crimes against humanity charged against the cement giant in 2019. But that ruling has just been overturned by France's top court. Lafarge was accused of paying millions of dollars to fighters, including ISIL, to keep its factory open. The company eventually left Syria in 2014 after ISIL seized its plant northeast of Aleppo. It has admitted some mistakes but denies the allegations against it. The Court of Cassation's decision does not mean the company will automatically face trial, but it's referred the matter back to investigating magistrates to reconsider the complicity charge, saying, one can be complicit in crimes against humanity even if there's no intention of being associated with the crimes committed. It added knowingly paying several million dollars for an organization whose sole purpose was exclusively criminal suffices to constitute complicity, regardless of whether the party concerned was acting to pursue a commercial activity. The proceedings against Lafarge are the result of a complaint filed by the French Finance Ministry, 11 former Syrian employees and two NGOs. The company had evacuated its foreign staff when it left the country, but kept some Syrian employees. We asked the company to stop the work, but they didn't stop. The company bears responsibility for all those who were arrested, killed or kidnapped. My nephew Yassin worked for Lafarge. He went from here to go to his work and ISIL arrested him and put him in jail. After four months, we went to see ISIL and asked about Yassin. They opened his file and told us they executed him. Lafarge is not the first multinational to be accused of similar accusations, but such cases have rarely been brought to trial. Twelve Nigerians took energy giant Shell to court in the U.S. for its role in rights abuses in the Niger Delta in the 1990s. The Supreme Court dismissed the case in 2013, saying it did not have jurisdiction over the matter. Rights groups also challenged companies suspected of concealing crimes against humanity in China's Xinjiang region. Let's bring in our guests in Paris. We have Nasira Genif. She is a sociologist and professor at the University of Paris 8 in Berlin. We have Canel Levite, a legal advisor at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, one of the organizations that filed the complaint against Lafarge. In Doha, Marwan Qabalan, head of policy analysis at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Welcome to the uh, program. Nasira, how significant is the ruling that came out in Paris from the court about the case of Lafarge? I would say that it's a breakthrough. It's uh, quite surprising, especially after the Court of Appeal decision that took place uh, now two years ago. And it's a very strong sign and uh, signal towards those that think that business as, as usual can go on, especially on, uh, uh, on, war on war fronts in all kinds of places where uh, wars are being uh, wages by especially uh, Occidental and Western countries. So I would say that it's quite striking, especially considering that uh, yesterday was the first day of the nine-month-long trial of uh, people responsible for the mm -hmm. attacks on November two, 2015 in Paris. 
So it has a very strong symbolic and political uh, range. Uh, Canal, we this has been a long ride for your organization. But do you think that you've reached a point where you could de you could say it's just a matter of time before Lafarge faces the, uh, uh, the 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 main charge, which is complicity in crimes against humanity? Yes, I would definitely say so. So it, it's a breakthrough. Now we have to see, uh, you know, the appeals courts will have to rule again on whether Lafarge was right in asking the cancellation of this charge for, crime, for complicity in crimes against humanity. So we will have to see how the new appeals court, like newly composed, will deal with this uh, request from Lafarge. We know that it will do so bearing in mind the new interpretation of complicity uh, that the Supreme Court yesterday uh, ruled and which is, we can go in details about that if you want, but once the appeals court uh, will confirm once again, or will confirm, sorry, that the indictment for complicity in crimes against humanity has to be maintained mm -hmm. based on this new interpretation of complicity, we can hope for a trial, not only on this charge of complicity for crimes against humanity, but also on the other charges mm -hmm. of financing of terrorist enterprise and endangerment of people's lives. Marwan, it's been almost like 10 years since to the start of the uprising in Syria, and many companies have been operating in areas widely accused of colluding with armed groups, including ISIL. This ruling, uh, does it put more emphasis now than ever on every international, multinational company that was operating in Syria? You're absolutely right, uh, Hisham. Uh, I think uh, it shed the light it shed some light actually on this illicit business between uh, uh, international companies and uh, uh, some violent groups in, in Syria. But this particular case is, is, is unique in the sense that it's dealing with a, with a company that, uh, that has a very strong ties to the French uh, government. If, you, if, you, if we want to put this in, into context, maybe we need to speak a little bit about how important this project was actually for both France and the Syrian regime at the time when it was first built actually in 2008. Uh, Hisham, the, the Lavage cement uh, factory was the largest single foreign investment project in Syria ever. It cost Lavage more than $680 million at the time actually to build one of the largest and most modern cement factory, not only in Syria, but in the entire Middle East. The production of that factory was like seven, uh, 8,000 tons of cement a day, uh, worth of half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge investment, actually, by, by the French. And it was a joint venture, in fact, between the French and businessmen who were very close to the Syrian regime at that time. And because of this huge investment, the company actually did not want actually to desert the, 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 the factory or leave it actually to be looted or be okay. uh, uh, dismantled by militant groups at that time. So they were actually keen to protect it and to keep it uh, in operation. They don't want to lose all the, the money that invested at that time in Syria. So that was this was this this is why it's a unique case okay. in in the case of of of, of Lafarge. Nasira, the legal team of Lafarge is quite obvious. They were trying to scrap the crime against humanity charge against them, but then the ruling came out to the uh, uh, towards another direction, which is basically we will have to magistrates will have to reinvestigate the whole case. Mm -hmm. It could be a breakthrough, as you said earlier, but at the same time, it could just open the window for Lafarge to bring about a stronger team in the near future and say, you know what, we're not to be held accountable at all. There's absolutely no strong evidence we've been doing something dodgy in Syria. Yes, but I think they will have then to argue word by word, sentence by sentence about what uh, the Court of Cassation just uh, stated. And that makes the case very difficult for them. Uh, of course, they can bring to the trial uh, very uh, efficient and very savvy uh, uh, groups of lawyers, but they will have to face that um, 
at a moment where uh, being the country and the home of uh, defense, which is what France claims to be, I mean, the country of human rights, is something that is more and more put into question. And Lafarge is giving this very strong expression and example of how human rights were just put aside. And uh, this company, this international company that is has close ties to the French state, as uh, was just said, uh, just looked the other way when it came to defending human rights. So the case is going to be very difficult for them to make whatever they bring in terms of mm -hmm. uh, lawyers and money and influence also, and lobbying, probably. Canal Lafarge is a financial goliath in Europe. They have huge resources. They have the backing of a government. But then one of the key moments of their trial was when they said, you know what, we have the local staff operating in Syria, and it is the one which should be held responsible for any mistakes. As far as we are concerned, the top echelons of the company based in Paris, there's absolutely nothing uh, wrong that we did. And how do you see that particular angle? Yes, so this argument they made uh, in the judicial inquiry is a very typical recurring argument that multinationals make to try exonerate from their responsibility. They hide behind their complex structures and they hide behind the fact that they operate through subsidiaries that are abroad. And they pretend that they don't know what is happening in the subsidiaries, that they don't have the powers, the competence or the means to stop uh, actions of their subsidiaries abroad when those actions may lead to the commission of crimes or to the fueling of grave crimes. And this argument, I, I must say, we, we have reviewed it quite, quite easily because the evidence in the file is extremely clear. Uh, when it comes to payments that have been made to several armed groups, including ISIS, um, it is clear that the, um, the members of parent, uh, the parent company in Paris, headquartered in Paris, were not only aware of those payments, but were sometimes instructing them together with the subsidiary. So there, this argument of Lafarge really doesn't hold anymore. And uh, legally, this has translated in the decision of the appeals court, uh, which hasn't been put into question by the Supreme, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the decision, yeah, hasn't been put into question by the Supreme Court, which is that Lafarge parent company uh, is indicted for uh, the financing of a terrorist enterprise, although the payments had originated from the accounts of its subsidiary abroad. And the court indicted the parent company because it took into account the evidence in the file mm -hmm showing that they were informed, but it also mentioned, and this is a very strong element of this case also, uh, the appeals court mentioned that because Lafarge parent company has such a strong financial and operational control over its subsidiary, it wouldn't make sense legally to say that it cannot be held responsible okay. for payments, criminal payments paid by the subsidiary. Marwan, there is an international coalition against ISIL. It has its own counter ISIS finance group. And it has been pretty much trying to work out ways to, uh, to disrupt the financial flows going towards these groups. Do you think that this case in particular could be conducive to a broader investigation where we might see multinational companies being held accountable for shoddy businesses with groups like ISIL and other armed groups that were operating in areas uh, in, in, in Syria, particularly the northeastern and northern parts of the country and the southeastern parts of Syria? Absolutely. I think uh, this time maybe because you, usually the United States in particular, because uh, as you know, Hisham, the Americans who are leading this war uh, uh, in order to undermine the, the, the network, the financing network of, of terrorism um, uh, all over the world, they, they usually focus on, on Arab and Muslim countries. And I mean, they, they keep come, uh, come and go actually to the, to the Gulf region in particular in order to disrupt and uh, speak with the governments in order to undermine these, these networks. But sometimes you, you are really surprised to see that some of the, the big Western companies like Lavage, for example, was very much involved into the business of financing ISIL. Um, uh, and, and also, you, 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 if, if you want to, uh, if you want to look to, into another uh, into another aspect of this of this issue of this issue, you can also see the link between the French government, Lavage, uh, and the YPG, 
because I mean the, the, the French they have been they have been relying very much and Lavage also they have been relying very much on the YPG regime in Syria, which was also considered by other countries in the region, such as Turkey, for example, as a terrorist organization. They were relying on them in order to protect the Lavage cement factory in, in, in Syria. So I think we have to look very carefully into okay. into all sorts of, of business act activities of these companies, not only in terms of finance sector, but also in terms of the links that they are having with other non-state actors in the region, like the YPG, for example. Nasira, you spoke about the uh, the crucial timing of the ruling because it coincides at the same time with the trial of the main suspect of the rampage that killed 130 people in, uh, in, in France in 2000. And 15. Could this be a moment where the judges, the courts will say, you know what, it's about time to tackle this because this is a serious issue that could also ultimately have serious ramifications on Lafarge itself? Yes, I think that what it brings to the picture is the complexity of what was happening back then at the beginning of uh, the uprising in Syria the way it was uh, um, repressed, of course, by the Syrian state, the way ISIS eventually became and uh, prevailed in Syria. But this means that it has ramification all across the region, all the way through uh, the Mediterranean to Paris. And this is also important to, to stress the fact that we cannot think in terms of war and terror this era that we entered in 2001 and that we are still living in uh, without including all parts that took advantage of these wars that um, raised their own uh, prosperity on these wars and this is something that might uh, change the backdrop of uh, the trial that is happening right now in Paris and bring into the picture things that usually are kept aside or that are overlooked or that a lot of states would just mm -hmm. want to turn a blind eye on. And this has to be part of the picture now, the complexity and all the interest that took part into what led to the rampage in mm -hmm. Paris, but more widely to all these wars and their casualties. Uh, Canal, navigating through the judicial system all over the world is a very complex task, as you know. But do you see an opening here where activists could say, you know what, it's about time to focus on companies operating air in areas where there are human rights violations and abuses? We've seen a case now being brought against companies operating in Xinjiang, because they're saying basically how can you operate in a place where the Uyghur community is being uh, persecuted by the Chinese government? Yes, I think really this case has the potential to encourage, foster uh, either ongoing cases on corporate accountability against multinationals, but also maybe encourage other people to take initiatives like that. You were talking about the Uyghurs case. There's also a case pending before the International uh, Criminal Court related to the responsibility of arms traders from different European countries who persist in exporting weapons to Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates. Although those two countries are uh, leading the coalition that appears to have committed uh, systematic attacks on civilians in Yemen. Um, so I think now the ruling that Lafarge, that the Supreme Court gave yesterday, is really going to inform the way those cases will be dealt, dealt by uh, the different uh, courts concerned. Marwan, these are companies, middlemen, people working in the un underground, some of them affiliated with huge organizations, with governments. We've seen in the past many evidences directing toward very high profile people who were dealing with the Syrian government, with ISIL when it comes to shipments of uh, oil. But ultimately, you don't get a sense that the international community is willing to move forward and bring all these people accountable. What's the general sentiment among the Syrian people when you, they look at these particular cases that go somehow unpunished by the international community? Well, Hisham, I think, first of all, I mean, we need maybe to, to look at the, this greater picture of the war economy that has been um, uh, actually uh, emerging in Syria over the past uh, 10 years, in which, as you said, we have so many warlords, we have so many middlemen who are, uh, in fact, profiting 
uh, on the expense of those people actually who have paid the heaviest price during the war. Um, and you, you are you're absolutely right. I think we have to think about how, how at this particular stage we need to um, uh, we need to uh, to focus on the on transitional justice uh, for those people who who, ha who who their life actually has been destroyed by this uh, by this war and by this uh, also um, uh, business uh, uh, activities mm -hmm. uh, by the by the by the warlords uh, and by the middlemen and by the companies who have been mainly concerned about how to make profit out of, out of this out of this war. But at this point of um, uh, uh, of the crisis, Hisham, uh, most people right now are concerned about uh, keeping the peace and try to reach a comprehensive uh, ceasefire to the conflict in Syria. Because as you know, over the past few weeks, uh, there has been a renew of uh, uh, of confrontation uh, in the in the southern part of Syria, and mainly in Daraa. Mm -hmm. We see uh, almost daily bombardment of uh, of civilian uh, neighborhoods in in Idlib in the in the north. So right now, most people are focusing on how actually to stop this conflict mm -hmm. before start dealing with the with the other uh, aspects of it, including transitional justice uh, and. Um, uh, and okay. helping people actually regain their life. Nasira, you have the ethics and you have the greedy companies looking for profit and both collide most of the time. But do you think that this could be the moment where the momentum should be building towards rewriting the laws internationally to put an end to the practice of these companies taking advantage of cover from their own governments to take money from people in countries who face destruction and death? Yes, absolutely. But I think that we have the, the tools and the means to do that. It's just that so far, this kind of international companies, such as Lafargue and others, just felt that uh, national and international laws were not made for them, that they could just get away with it and uh, just find ways to bypass any kind of control. And uh, so the decision of the Court of Cassation is, uh, is uh, most meaningful in that respect, mm -hmm. because it means that they cannot, uh, they are just as any other uh, uh, entity and they can fall under the the, the rule and the, and the strength of these of these laws and of these uh, uh, different uh, bodies of uh, of jurisdiction and this is something quite uh, striking and might be might open new paths for mm -hmm. uh, those entities and uh, international companies uh, that rely on the laws of capitalism so that they become accountable for, to, for the crimes that they take part in. Canal, you know that as a legal advisor that ultimately you will have to deal with companies affiliated with governments. They have loads of cash and they have a cover and they have the backing of strong governments all over uh, the world. Do you feel like that we've reached the point where NGOs will be more equipped, will have more backing, particularly from the people all over the world, to put an end to the practice of greedy companies working in war zones? Yes, so we, we are gathering experiences. We're gathering expertise on what are the obstacles that are faced in those judicial proceedings. And we surely, I think, get better in anticipating those, those obstacles. But when it comes to, to governments um, and to the fact that governments are also linked uh, sometimes to those business activities, I think we're seeing this, tra this tr uh, trend in the business and human rights movement more and more. Then those cases of corporate accountability usually do not only involve a company, but also sometimes have the support of a state. Uh, for instance, I was talking about those arms exports cases earlier. Their arms exports or arms traders are given uh, export licenses by governments. Uh, we also know in cases related to, to climate change or to pollution that um, ex um, industrial exploitation projects of land also beneficiate from licenses to, to exploit you. the land or to... So this is... This is definitely a trend we need to monitor. Kanal Lavita, Nasira Genev, and Marwan Qabalani. I really appreciate your insight and looking forward to talking to you in the near future.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story from me, Hashim Al-Bara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.